Good morning. Welcome to the Liberty Church of Christ, where we are gathering together online to worship today. We're not meeting at the building today or next week, but we're so glad that you're with us this morning to worship God together. We are going to worship Him the way He wants to be worshiped. We will sing, pray, preach, take the Lord's Supper together, and give of our means. So, as we begin our worship today, so glad you're with us. Let's begin our worship with a prayer. Mighty God, thank you so much for this beautiful day. And we're glad that we can gather together, even though it's online, but we thank you for this venue. We thank you for the ability to meet even when we cannot meet due to various reasons. God, you know that the coronavirus is a very uh, bad thing. It's, it's hurt a lot of people. It's changed a lot of lives. We pray, Father, that you will remove it from mankind. We know that uh, you are in control and you're not surprised, but we also know that you listen to the prayers of your saints, of your children, and we are asking you to remove this problem from off the planet and specifically out of America and specifically more so out of our own lives and our communities and our own families and our church here at Liberty I pray, Father, that things will get back to a degree of normalcy so that we can enjoy each other face to face. But thank you that we can come together like this. We pray that you will accept our worship today. There are those that are grieving, and uh, we pray, Father, that you'll bless them. Their hearts are broken because they lost someone so dear to them to death. Maybe they lost someone because of a relationship that's broken, or maybe they're in uh, pain today. They're in pain because of sickness or they're in pain for some other ailment. I pray, Father, that you'll bless them in every way. You know who they are. We lift them up to you. Thank you for listening to our prayers. And we want to say thank you for the prayers that you answered. So many times we'll ask you for things. And you told us to ask you for things, but we'll not take the time to stop and say thank you when you answer those prayers in a positive way. And you say, yes, we're thankful for the prayers that have been answered that we have prayed to you. God, we pray for our country. We, we know that there is things about to happen in our country. There's a major election coming up. And I pray, Father, that you will put your hand in it. I know that you are concerned about world affairs. You're concerned about the affairs of men. And I pray that you will see to it that the president of the United States is the right man for the job. I also pray, Father, that all the senators and congressmen and, and whomever is on the ballot this November, that you will intervene and that your people will be in the power because we realize that the government is a powerful influence on our lives individually. Please, Father, be with us in this particular worship. And we lift you up, we adore you, we honor you, we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The uh, first song that we're going to be singing today in our song books, if you are a member here at Liberty and you have a copy of the song book, it's on page 229, 229. And the song is The Lord's Supper. We are singing this song to prepare our minds to take communion. For those of you that are not a member of the Liberty Church of Christ or the Lord's Church around the country or the world, uh, this is something that we do because we believe the Bible says to do it. Acts chapter 20, verse number 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we are commanded by God as part of our worship to take the Lord's Supper. So we're going to sing this song to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a very important part of our worship we, where we're concentrating on the Lord's body and the Lord's blood. And we are taking this as a message to one another to show the Lord's death till he comes. And we know that he will be coming. So let's prepare our minds by singing this song, uh, The Lord's Supper is the title. 
When we meet in sweet communion, where the feast divine is spread, hearts are brought in closer union, while partaking of the bread. Precious feast, all else surpassing, wondrous love for you and me. While we feast, cry gently whispers, do this in my memory. Feast divine, all else surpassing, precious blood for you and me. While we sup, Christ gently whispers, do this in my memory. Precious feast, all else surpassing, wondrous love for you and me. While we feast, Christ gently whispers, do this in my memory. Certainly we take the Lord's Supper in Christ's memory. Have your communion supplies ready, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. Uh, I'm using today a pre-packaged uh, communion supply. Some of you may have that. I'm going to take just a moment to prepare it because sometimes it's a little bit difficult to get it ready when the time comes to observe it. So I'm going to go ahead and peel back and get ready for the juice. And then I'm going to go ahead and peel back the top portion to get ready for the bread. You may want to go ahead and take this time to prepare that too. The bread is the unleavened bread, and it is the body of Jesus Christ. God told us to remember the death of Jesus, and he gave his body on the cross for the remission of our sins. And we are to take it upon the first day of the week. When the disciples gathered together uh, in the first century, that's what they did. And they took it, and they offered prayer, and then they ate of the body. Then they offered another prayer, and they ate, drank of the fruit of the vine, which to us as Christians is the blood of Jesus. And it's in the death of Christ on the cross is where he gave that body, and he shed that blood. So let's do it in his memory. Let's have a prayer for the loaf. Mighty God, such a serious thing that we're doing right now, we call it communion, common union, where the saints are gathered together to, to eat of this bread, which to us as Christians is the body of Jesus Christ. We realize, God, that uh, you gave your only son and you prepared his body to be a perfect living sacrifice for us. He died on that cross in imperfection, and you raised him from the dead the third day. We're so grateful for that, but it is today that we honor his death, and we remember his death. So bless this bread as we take it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's have a prayer for the fruit of the vine. 
It's in like manner, Heavenly Father, that we thank you for this fruit of the vine, fruit of the grapevine, which to us as Christians is the blood of Jesus Christ. Help us all as we drink this uh, fruit of the vine, that it reminds us, it takes us back to the cross where that precious blood was shed. And without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. Thank you so much, Jesus. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Another part of our worship, very important part of our worship, is giving. Uh, we sing, pray, preach, which we'll do in just a few moments from the Word of God. And not only do we sing, pray, preach, we take the Lord's Supper, which we just did, and we're about to give of our means. We address God in our prayer, but we do it in the authority or by the authority of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus. That's why we say at the end of our prayers, typically it's in Jesus' name we pray, uh, and so we are going to address God and thank him for all the blessings that we enjoy. But the privilege of being able to give back just a, a portion uh, that we have set aside and we're to do it cheerfully. We're to do it with a, uh, the right spirit and the right heart because it's part of worship. It's not just paying the light bills. Uh, it is giving God homage in, in our giving to him. Let's pray. Mighty God, thank you so very much for the privilege to be able to worship you today. And thank you for all the blessings that we enjoy in this life. We pray, Father, that as we give back a portion of what you've given us, that we will do so in a well-pleasing manner. Help us to use our blessings wisely to bring you glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Get your song books and turn to page 258. We're going to be singing that song uh, in, in right before our message. 258, it's when we all get to heaven. And we are certainly looking forward to that. 258. Let's sing the first and the last verse. And then we'll have a message from God's Word. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory Will the toils of life repay when we all get to heaven? What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. When we all get to heaven, and we are certainly looking forward to doing that, are we not? We know that if Jesus delays his coming, we will have to pass through that shadowy veil we call death. But beyond that veil is heaven. We're going to heaven someday. When Jesus comes back, those of us who have not passed through the veil, if he delays his coming, we'll all do that. But if he doesn't, if he comes back today and we're still alive, our bodies will be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, 
and we will get to go to heaven to be with him for eternity. And we're all going to get to go do that if we are in Christ. If we've been baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins, we've put on Christ, we are prepared to meet him. And we are doing that by encouraging one another. We are. Every day we have got to encourage each other to remain faithful and, and be ready. We at Liberty have been engaged in a study on Sunday morning, and the name of that study has been To Be or Not to Be. That is the question. Now, what we mean by that is to be something. To be something means to be in a state of something. And we got a choice. We can be it or we can not be it. And that's the question. The last few weeks, we talked about to be or not to be steadfast. With all the influences in the world headed our way and influencing us, we had to make a choice. And we have to make a choice every day. Are we going to be steadfast or we're not going to be steadfast? Also, we talked about to be of good cheer. Let's be of good cheer and be holy. That's the question. Are we going to be holy or not to be holy? And of course, we talked about being holy means to be separate, uh, be, be prepared for God, be set apart to do God's will. We talked about being wise, to be or not to be wise. We could choose to be foolish or we could choose to be wise like the world. But we need to choose to be wise with God's wisdom. Last week, we talked about be saved. To be or not to be saved. That is the question. And I hope that you tuned that in last week. Look it up to talk about how to be saved. Somebody says, well, we shouldn't be asking that question. What must I do to be saved? Because it genders a lot of strife in the r religious world and Christianity. Because so many people have so many different answers of, of how to be saved, what to do to be saved. Do you even have to do anything to be saved? Maybe God just predestines you to be saved. But it's a legitimate question. And uh, it was asked in the first century, Brethren, what must I do to be saved? And it was asked over and over again. And the question was answered in those particular passages and, and answered quite directly. And so tune into that last week, what to do to be saved. And we need to be saved. Today, we're going to finish our series with one more B. Now, we could talk about the Bs for, for Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. There's so many things that we need to be be in a state of. But we're going to end it up today with to be or not to be an example. That's right. We need to be an example. Now, the, the fact of the matter is we are an example. Uh, whatever you do in your word and your action and what, whatever thing that goes on that people see, then you're an example. It may be a good example. It may be a bad example. But it's nonetheless an example. And we are to be an example. And that means to be a good example. Be a positive example. I want to read from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 21. For even hereunto were ye called. This is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Hereunto you were you called. Because Christ also suffered for us, having, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. You know, that's a fact. We are to be a follower of Christ. He is our example. In this case, in this text, he's an example of suffering. And many Christians suffer and, and we need to endure the, the, the sufferings, just like Christ did. But there's so many things that Jesus was an example to us. We are to follow, what did he say in that verse? Follow his steps. Whatever he does, in his word, and his actions, we're to follow that. He is our example. 
The word example in that text is a Greek word, comes from a Greek word, hypogrammos. I don't speak Greek, but I looked that word up. And that word, hypogrammos, what does it mean? What, how do you break that down? Well, hypo means under. For example, if you were to talk about a hypodermic needle, uh, dermic is skin, dermatology. Hypo means under, under the skin. Hypoglycemia, glycemia talks about your sugar. Hypo means low or under the sugar level. So hypogrammos, hypo means under. Grammos is where we get our word grammar, and it has to do with writing, making prepositional phrases just right, uh, and direct objects and verbs and nouns. That's your grammar. So it's writing. So hypogrammos literally means under writing, under write. Here, here's the idea of it being an example and under writing. If your teacher, when you were in grammar school, uh, gave you a, an example on the board, or maybe she gave it to you on your, your paper and, and it was written down. Here's your ABCs. Here's how you make an A. Here's how you make a B. And then it's all written down on that top line. Well, underneath that, your job was to copy that exactly the way it was written at the top. So you were to underwrite it. So that A, you went underneath and you wrote it down, just like the example said. The B, just like the example was on the paper, you were to get under it and write the B and C all the way down to the Z. And, and you were to underwrite as the example. Now, here's what happens. The further you go down that page, because she told you you need to do it 20 times or maybe 10 times or ever how many times, the further you go down on that page, wasn't it true the sloppier it got? When you were, got down to the, the 20th line, boy, it looked pitiful. Maybe it's because you're tired, maybe because you're bored, but maybe it was because the further you get from the example, the more your eyes are further down the page, so you're not looking at the example like you were. That's what happens in the religious world, too. The further we get our eyes off Jesus, the less like Jesus we look. What if everyone in the church followed your example or my example? What if they were attending church like we attend church? What if they were giving of their means like we give of our means? What if they were living their life just like we live our life? What would the church look like? What would... How would the church do its work? Would it be in good shape? Great shape even? Or would it be lacking? We are to be Christian and follow the example of Christ and be as close to him as we can possibly get so that we can say to others like Paul did, be ye followers of me as I follow him. So if we look like Christ and people follow our example, then they will look like Christ. But if we're sloppy and we look very little like Christ and they follow that example, it will be a mess. Christ is our ultimate example. We are to underwrite and keep our eyes on our example so that it would look good. God loves examples. God, God used examples over and over and over again. In Hebrews chapter number 8, verse number 5, let me read that text to you. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. God has so many shadows in the Old Testament to bring us to the New Testament where Christ is our deliverer. He's our Savior. So he says, as Moses was admonished of God, 
God admonished Moses to do that. What did he admonish him to do? When he was about to make the tabernacle, here's what God said to him. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Moses, when you were up there on Mount Sinai, I gave you a pattern, an example, and you are to follow. You see that you follow that pattern because everything that you're about to build in that tabernacle, the tabernacle itself, the furniture of the tabernacle, all these things are going to point to Jesus. They're going to talk about Jesus. They're, they're a shadow of Jesus. They're an example of what we see in Christ. He says, so you follow that example very carefully. God loves examples. He loves to use examples and shadows to the intent that we can see those examples, learn from them, and obey them, and follow them, follow the pattern. Now, he gives us negative examples. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 6, Here's what that verse says. Now, these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. He's talking about their forefathers. When Paul was writing to the Corinthians and he was talking about these people that followed Moses out of Egyptian bondage, they followed their own lusts. And uh, he said, that's a bad example. That's a negative example. He said, these were our examples to the intent. Here's the reason I gave you these examples that you should not. It's a negative example. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11, still talking about these forefathers that didn't believe. He says, let us, therefore, this is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. Let us labor, work, therefore, to enter into that rest. We, we need to work to go to heaven. Uh, there was an example. There was a shadow in the Old Testament, Canaan land, the land of promise, the land of rest. And these people back then didn't go into that land. If you remember the 10 spies that came back, said we can't take it, the two that said we could, and they followed the 10 and they died in the wilderness because they didn't believe. We don't need to have, that's a negative example. That's what he says lest any man fall short or fall after the same example of unbelief. They didn't believe, so they didn't get to go into Canaan land, the land of rest, the promised land. So let's not be, that's a, that's a negative example. We should believe so that we will get to go into our land of rest, which of course is heaven. There's so many negative examples. One negative example is Jude, Chapter number one, verse seven. Here's what that verse says. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, listen, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, that fire didn't last eternally, but it's eternal in the example. And we're looking at that even today. Thousands of years later, we're saying, you know, we don't want to be like Sodom. We don't want to be Sodomites. We don't want to be like Gomorrah. It's an eternal example, and it is keeping us from our eternal fire that's in our future if we follow after that negative example. There's positive examples, too. James chapter 5, verse number 10 says this. Take, my brethren, the prophets. Here's a positive example. Who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example. Of what? Of suffering, affliction, and, and of patience. They suffered afflictions, but they endured. That's what patience means. So you can suffer afflictions, but look at those positive examples of the prophets. Who they also suffered affliction, but they didn't quit. So you don't quit either. Also, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 12 is a positive example. Timothy was being written to by his mentor, Paul. Paul wrote 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. And he's telling Timothy, let no man despise thy youth. 
you're a young man and people can reject you because you're young, and, but don't let them. He says, be thou an example. You need to be a good positive example of the believers. How? In your word, what you say, in your conversation, what you do, and in your charity, that's your love, your spirit, and uh, that's what he says next, in your spirit, it's your attitude, and he says your faith, what you depend on, what you trust, and in purity, that's your holiness, to, to be separated for God and by God. You need to be a good example, a positive example to all these brethren who might want to reject you, but they won't if you are a good example. Now, some of them will. A lot of people reject you anyway, whether you're a good example or a bad example. Uh, they reject that example. But, but the, the encouragement is to be a good example, a positive example. 1 Peter chapter number 5, verse 3, the elders of the church. We lost one of our elders uh, this past week. He passed away, and we're so sad about that. But he was to be a, an example. He was living his life to be a good example. And our other three elders are, are good examples. Listen to what 1 Peter 5, verse 3 says. Neither as being lords over God's heritage. You're not just there telling folks this and telling folks that and lording over them. No, no. He says, but in contrast, be examples to the flock. Live your life as an example so that they can look at your example and underwrite. They can look up there and see it, and then they can live their life as the example. There are basic areas that we should, as a congregation, to be good examples, and as, as individuals, to be good examples and positive examples. But I'd like to focus on one verse, one text, verses 7 through 10 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. Read it with me. I'll put it on the screen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 10. So that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. You know, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, and if you get a map out, you will see that uh, where Greece is up to the north there, it was an area called Macedonia that day, and uh, the southern portion was Achaia, and the northern portion was Macedonia. But he's telling the Thessalonians who lived in Macedonia, pretty close to Philippi there. Uh, he said, you guys were examples to all those Christians in, in the northern Macedonia and in Achaia. Achaia is where Corinth was uh, and, and Athens. But in verse number eight, he says, for from you, you the guys there in Thessalonica, from you sounded out the word of the Lord not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. We don't even have to tell you to be good examples because you are, and, and everybody knows it. For, verse number nine, they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. And how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. You guys in Thessalonica used to worship uh, false gods and idols, but you turned from those things and you now serve the living and the true God, the one and only God. And verse number 10 says, And to wait for his Son, God's Son, from heaven, whom, that's his Son, he raised from the dead, who is it? Even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. In that text, we see five areas that we can be good examples. To them that believe, fellow Christians, we need to get ready when, when we all go to heaven. When we all get to heaven, it's going to be wonderful. So we need to encourage one another and be an example to each other, to help us. 
Now, generally, it's also true that people who are not Christians, who are not brethren, they can see these things too. And maybe they will become Christians. They will become believers because of our examples. Let's look at five areas in this text. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10, where we need to be good, positive examples. Let's go back to that. I'll put it on the screen. And I have those areas underlined. And uh, you might want to do that if you write in your Bible as well. He says, So that you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia, for from you, number one, sounded out the word of the Lord. There's your first one. Sounded out the word of the Lord. That means that you guys in Thessalonica taught people. You know the Bible. You know, you cannot teach what you do not know. Now, a lot of people try to. A lot of people try to teach things that they don't even know what they're talking about. But what, what Paul is saying there to these Thessalonians, he's saying, look, or Thessalonians, he said, you guys know your Bible. You, you learn it. You learn, of course, he was writing the Bible as he spoke, but he was saying, you have learned the truth and you sound out the word of the Lord. You're telling others about it. Folks, it's so good to be an example is it not to be a good example of somebody who knows the Bible, who knows the word of the Lord, and is teaching it, is sounding it out, is getting the word out there. We're teaching now as we speak to, to one another. We're sounding out the word so that you can hear it, I can hear it, we can be encouraged so that we can all go to heaven someday. It's a wonderful thing. And non-Christians could, could listen, and, you know, they know their Bible. They know what they're talking about. They're not just making stuff up and doing things because that's what they decided to do. They know the Bible. They know the word of the Lord, and they're sounding it out. They know the Bible. They teach the Bible. The second thing that we can be good examples in, he says, For from you, verse number 8, sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. What? Your faith to Godward is spread abroad. Your faith to Godward. That means you guys believe and you trust God. People know the difference. When, when you sound out the word of the Lord and you say, this is what the Bible says, but you don't live by it. You don't trust it. You don't believe it. They pick that up pretty quickly. Uh, we here at Liberty encourage one another because we believe it. Uh, we know the Bible is true, and we trust the Bible is true. We depend on the Word of God. When he says that we're to trust it and ask for our daily bread, that's what we do. We ask for it, and we, we depend on God for it. We seek those things of, of the kingdom of God first, and all these things we trust, we depend on God to provide them for us. Folks, we have got to have faith. We've got to have trust. Without faith, it's really impossible to please God according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. We cannot please God without faith toward God. we got to have our faith. So not only do we hear the word of God and, and we know it and we sound it out, we, we also trust in it. We believe in the word of God. And we trust the word of God. The third thing that we're looking at in that text is in verse number 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in, uh, in we had unto you, and, listen, how you turn to God. You turn to God. The word turn, we get our, that's where we get repent. You, you turned away from idols and you turned toward God. That's what a good example is is of repentance. We need to repent. Folks, there are things in our lives that we used to do. These Thessalonians, these Thessalonians, they used to serve other gods, but they turned away from those things and served the one and only true God. We need to turn away from our previous lifestyle too. When we do that, we're repenting. 
We're repenting from our old ways. And that's a good example. See, it's a good example to hear the Word of God, to, to, to know it, and to sound it out to others, to tell others about it. It's a good example to trust in it, to believe in it. And it's a very good example to repent of our old ways. The Bible tells us that that way is bad. This is way is good. And so we used to live that way. Now we want to turn from that and live the right way. That's why we sound out the Word of God is to tell people what God wants and what pleases God. And we're terrible examples, awful examples. If we ourselves don't do it, we tell others, you need to do this, you need to do that. The Bible says this and that and the other. And then we go off and do the same things or don't do the same things that we're supposed that we're teaching others. What an example is that? It's a bad example. It's a negative example. And there's too many people professing to be Christians that do that. They don't truly repent of their old ways. But a good example is to turn from your old ways. The fourth one that we're looking at, let's get back to the screen there, is he says in, you, you turn from idols, and I didn't underline this, so he says, serve the living and true God. It's not only that you turn to God, that's repentance from idols, but you serve the living and true God. So you might want to underline, I failed to underline that, serve the living and true God. It's one thing to repent, turn from your old ways, but it's a whole different other way to serve the living and true God. And when we serve, we are obedient. We do what the Bible says do. And that's the fourth uh, good example. that we do. So many of us, we, we hear the word of God and we believe it and we repent of our sins, but we're not willing to obey God. We're not willing to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. We're not willing to be baptized into Christ. We're not willing to, to live the Christian life. And that is so sad. Uh, we need to not only repent of our turn from our old ways, but we need to serve the living and true God. That's a positive example. And then finally, the fifth one is found in verse number 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Jesus is coming back. There's no question about that. There's a lot of people that don't believe that. But just because they don't believe it doesn't make it not true. It is true. Jesus is coming soon morning or night or noon. We don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. We are good examples when we wait for his return. That means we anticipate it. We're looking forward to it. Every decision that we make in our lives is in lieu of and, and in thinking of the fact uh, that Jesus is coming back. We don't make decisions unless it's housed in the fact that he's coming back. It's in light of the fact that he's coming back. That's what your decisions are based upon. That's what my decisions are based upon, that he's coming back. And he's going to take those that are ready to heaven to be with God forever, and those that are unprepared and, and have not repented and, and are, they're not serving the, the living and true God, uh, they're not going to go to heaven. They're going to go to hell. So when we make decisions in our lives, it's in light of the fact that he's coming back. And so we make good decisions, positive decisions, and we are good examples because we wait, we anticipate, we live our lives faithfully. So to be a good example is to hear the word of God, believe it with all of our heart and teach it to others and sound that word out. And not only to do that, to repent, turn from our old ways, and to obey, serve the living and true God, and to live faithfully as we wait upon the Son of God to return. Let's be a good example today in these, and there's so many areas that we can be good examples. These are just five of, of good ways to be a good example. 
If you are not a Christian, let us at Liberty encourage you uh, to become a Christian, to be saved, and to be a good example. Perhaps you are a Christian and you've been baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins after having repented and confessed and, and, you, and you believe. But somewhere along the way, you've been a, a poor example. And if the whole church acted like you, followed you as an example, followed me as an example, what, what kind of church would it be? Maybe you have been a poor example. Let me encourage you and challenge you to repent of that and do better. I want to do better. Thank you for being a part of our worship today. We're going to go to God in prayer and close, and we invite you to come back and be with us right here on this Facebook channel or YouTube channel tonight at 6 p.m. We're not meeting at the building, but we'll be online to worship God for our evening worship. Hope you attend. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for everything that you do for us. Help us to be better and to be positive and good examples. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.